We've seen in the first section of this part that the rules in the logic program amount to sufficient conditions for an atom being true. Well, if one only takes this specification literally and just interprets the rules as implications in classical logic, we get quite a lot of models, right? Then we actually applied the idea of Keith Clark, who modeled closed world reasoning back in the uh, end of the 70s, with the, with the idea that saying, okay, here's a, here's a specification, here's a program, but actually interpreting this program under closed world reasoning amounts to adding the necessary conditions to the specification. And this is done implicitly. And we have seen that more or less taking the original sufficient condition, adding the necessary condition, drastically reduces the, the, the models that we get, but not yet the stable models. But these models are nonetheless of interest. They were called the supported models. And this is also an interesting concept because in a supported model, each atom that is true is also justified by a rule whose body is true in the supported model. But you know, this type of support falls a bit short, right? Because it's just about one rule applying in this model. It's not about a proof that uh, goes back into the, um, into, into the facts. Okay, and we've, a closer inspection has already revealed that more or less these spurious models, the ones that, that are supported but unstable, have more or less circular rules that don't allow us to provide a finite derivation for things. So it's all now about cycles, right? And characterizing these guys, and hence you guess why actually this section here is called loops and loop formulas. Okay, let's delve into it. So we're still in pursuit of our quest whether there is a formula whose models correspond to the stable models of a given logic program. Now, why am I obsessed with this? Well, the thing is, if you want to compute the stable models of a logic program, you look for an assignment. So an assignment of true and false to each Boolean variable. And these are, of course, the models of something, right? Now, if we find this formula, this formula will have, will have a specification of the properties of the stable models. So in addition to just looking at the implication of a logic program, there will be a specification what it means that the model that we select is a stable model. What, what actually does, does it mean to be stable? And we've already seen a part of this. These are actually the necessary conditions for atoms, interpreting actually the, the, the rules in a program as the sufficient ones. Okay, now we've already made a big step in this direction we manage to isolate more or less the models that are called supported models, which are actually the models of the completion of a program. But we are not yet there, right? But more or less the observation was that if we take the, the models of the completion of a program, we have to eliminate the circular supports that give more or less infinite, infinite derivations. Okay, and here again there is, there is a fundamental idea by Lin and, and Zhao, two Chinese people from Hong Kong. Uh, and their idea was more or less to extend this notion of a completion by also adding additional formulas that prohibit circular support of atoms. Now the question is, where do we, or how can we make this circular support precise? And uh, well, we've already looked at, at that in the tightness section where we looked at the positive atom dependency graph. And that's the guy which we have to inspect a bit closer. Actually, in this atom dependency graph, we have to look for structures that take us from one atom to another atom and back again. And these guys are actually called loops. Now to capture the loops in a positive atom dependency graph, we use a concept we've already exploited back in the grounding part, namely that of a strongly connected component or a strongly uh, connected subgraph. More or less, a loop is per se, simply a set of atoms being a subset of all the atoms occurring uh, in a program. But when you look actually at the nodes in, of the loop in the graph, then there is a path from each node to each other node, or from each atom to each other atom. And of course, then there's also one uh, back again. 
Okay? And more formally, actually, such a set induces a strongly connected subgraph. And this is more or less just what I try to explain. So when you then look at the graph that only consists of the nodes in the loop, the atoms in the loop, and you restrict the edges also to, to the atoms in the loop, then in this tiny subgraph, each node is reachable uh, from any other node and vice versa. Okay? So this is a loop. And so, again, there, is, there are these non-trivial and non-zero. Again, a loop is non-empty, so there are always elements in it. And we look here at path of non-zero length. Uh, this may be interesting. On the very last slide of, of, of this section, I will actually talk about what we get when we also allow path of zero lengths. But let me zip it now. So we have a definition of a loop, and we denote all loops uh, of a program by loop of p. And what we already see here is that this uh, a, a program having loops, right, and a program being tight is tightly connected. Namely, a program is tight if and only if it has no loops. Okay, so this is more or less the central uh, concept of this section. And so let's delve into some examples. Let us first have a look at our running example along with its self-referential rule E if E. We've already seen in the previous section that this rule induces a self-loop in terms of graph theory, namely an arc from E to E. And in fact, the node E along with this self-loop constitute a strongly connected subgraph of the positive atom dependency graph. Hence, it doesn't come as a surprise that the singleton set containing E only is a loop, and actually it's the only loop in our example. So, let us perhaps look as well at the unstable supported model and what we see now with this loop on that. Okay, this is the, this is the more or less the, the fishy model I was calling it before, which is a supported model, but not a stable model. And actually for, for this set to be a stable model, the set must equal the consequences of the program reduced by this model. Now let's do that, right? Let's, let's actually calculate what we get here on the right-hand side. So if we take this supported model and reduce our program with it, we get this positive program. And now computing the consequences, well, boils down to, well, we have A, and with A we get C, but that's it, right? A and C are the consequences of the program reduced with this supported yet unstable model. And surprise, surprise, this does not reproduce the original guess, right? So there is a gap uh, between AC on, on, the, on the side of the consequences from the reduced program and ACE as the supported model. And interestingly, the loop lies in this gap. And this is actually not a coincidence, this is actually a, 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 fee, a property actually whenever we have supported but unstable models that there is a loop actually in the difference between the actual supported model and the consequences of the program reduced by the supported model. Well, this is the first insight, but let's look at another example to deepen this a bit. You may remember from the previous section that on this example we have a cycle spread among several rules, namely these two rules here. So we derive C if we can derive D, and we can derive D if we can derive C, that makes a cycle, and B. Okay, now this is reflected in the positive atom dependency graph as follows. Here we have uh, the atom D, here we have the atom C, and both of them can be reached from one another. Hence, these two nodes along with these two arcs, right? These are two arcs, one in each direction, uh, constitute a strongly connected subgraph. And again, the nodes of the strongly connected subgraph give us a loop in, in the sense of ASP, and we have a single one here, which is the set consisting of C and D. Okay, now let's just check actually about this property that I sketched on the previous example. For this, again, we look at this unstable supported model. Uh, here it, it is BCD. And keep in mind that there is a, another stable model, actually, which, con which contains B only. Now, if BCD would be a stable model, 
it would equal the consequences of the program reduced by it. Okay, let's look actually whether, we, whether this is the case and if not again, how does the difference be, look like? Okay, to this end, we take this supported model and reduce the program with it. So let's do that. Here we go. And if we now compute uh, the consequences of this program, we get B and B and B and nothing else. So we, the B is the logical consequence of the program reduced by this supported model. And well, it's easy to check actually that none of these four rules is applicable. So then taking this down again here to, to, to this position and, and looking at the difference between the supported model and the consequences of the program reduced by it, we only get B here on the right hand side. And again, the loop is contained in this difference here, right? And so this actually shows very nicely that these loops uh, are responsible for the mismatch between stable and supported models. Okay, anyway, in the first example we had a loop with one element, here we had a single loop with two elements. Let's also look at a program that has more loops. So here's finally an example with several loops. And again, let's not delve too much into the, the programs and its dependencies, because after all the dependencies are clearly visible by looking at the positive atom dependency graph. And here it is. Now looking at this guy and just looking for strongly connected subgraphs, we actually see right away, I think, two, right? So first of all, there is one between C and D, because there is an arc from C to D and from back from D to C. And in the same way, we have one, we have here another strongly connected subgraph because we, we have D and E and we can go from D to E directly and back. And in fact, all three of them also constitute a strongly connected subgraph because of course we can also go from C to D and then to E and back and from E to D. Anyway, all three nodes can be reached uh, from, from, one, from, one, from one another. Okay. And uh, otherwise that's all. And so we get three loops. And here it's actually important to note that you cannot just look at the minimal or maximal loops. You really have to look at all of them. You can optimize here and there a little bit, but in general, you have to look at all of them. Uh, well, actually before, before going on, let's perhaps briefly look actually how these loops are reflected in the program now that we know where to look. Now, the, the, the loop with C and D is actually among this and this rule here. So C relies on D, D relies on C, and back to square one. Now the second one of where we have D and E uh, is here. D relies on E and E relies on D. And then finally, the biggie here, these are the three rules uh, down here. So C relies on D, D relies on E, and E relies on C, and we're back to square one. So these are the three, the origins more or less of the three loops that we get uh, in our program. And I refrain now from giving you stable, supported models, discussing the difference between the Redux and so, because I think this is also for you a nice playground to work your way through this a little bit. But now the big question remains, now that we have identified more or less the source of the mismatch, how can we exploit the loops to synthesize, to put together formulas like the necessary completion formulas to eliminate the unstable yet supported models? And this will be done next. Stay tuned. Now, before we get lost in the technicalities uh, of the definition of, on loop formulas, let's step back a little bit and first think about what we need to capture. Actually, a loop as such, or more or less uh, a set of circularly depending uh, rules, is not necessarily harmful. We've seen this actually uh, in our second running example given at the end of the last uh, section where we had a stable model in which actually uh, a bunch of circular rules applied and provided conclusions contributing to the stable model. This was actually a harmless situation and the reason was because there was an external support. There was a rule that was independent of the loop. Simply it contributed an atom on on, on the loop and then actually the rules that, that induce the loop could just apply and give their contributions. 
actually in a, in a harmful scenario, it is the lack of such an external support that induces some of secularities that are up in the air that just, uh, well, support each other and that do not provide any finite derivations. And this is actually uh, a situation that we have to eliminate. These are supportive models that are unstable, where loops have no external support. Hence, the notion of an external support is a key concept in the definition of loop formulas. Well, now that I've bragged so much about the concept of an external support, let's first of all define it and see how it is then used to define loop formulas. So the external support is defined loop-wise. So we take a loop and then we define its external support as the set of all rules in the program that contribute to the loop, that is, whose head belongs to the loop, but whose positive body literals are disjoint from the loop. Hence, they are not involved in the circularities of the loop. Okay? So this is the external support of a loop, a set of rules that support the loop, but are not involved in the circularity of the loop. Okay, and with it, we can then define loop formulas. Now, also loop formulas are defined loop-wise. So the loop formula for a loop is defined as this formula here. And be before looking at the details, let's more or less see what it, what it says, right? So we have here a disjunction and here as well. And the disjunction is more or less uh, an existential quantification, right? You can say, well, there is some atom on the loop. So if, an at if some atom on the loop is true, then also some external support must be provided. That is, there must be some rule in the external support whose body is true. And again, we use this body formula abbreviation. This is what we used already when defining the completion formula, which takes the body of a rule and gives us the conjunction uh, of this body. So this is what a loop formula says. So if any atom on the loop becomes true, then there must be an external support that also be, has, has been true. Interestingly, one can rewrite this and just define it the other way around, right, by taking the contraposition of, of this implication. And perhaps for some of you this is more intuitive. And anyway, let's, let's also look at how to read this first. So this says if no external support of a loop is available, if all external supports are false, then also no atom on the loop can be true. Or in other words, if all external supports are inhibited, then all atoms on the loop must be false. And this is more or less another reading of, of the very first formula. Keep in mind that both formulas are logically equivalent, right? And it's up to you which one you like better. So once we have defined a loop formula and more or less saying exactly what, what is written here, a loop formula enforces that all atoms on the loop are false whenever the loop is not externally supported. Well, I now repeated that the third or the fourth time, but I think one really has to digest it. It took me actually quite a time until I really got this, this, this concept. Okay, now that we have defined uh, for each loop what it means to, to provide us with a loop formula, we can then collect all the loops uh, of a program, and these we then use here this abbreviation here, LF of P, analogously to CF of P with a completion formula. Okay, and that's it. Actually, before going on, let's briefly look at a simplification, because in the same way as we simplified the completion formula by realizing, well, after all, we're not so much interested in the rules, but actually to express these conditions, it, it, it suffices to look at the bodies. We can do the same here, and we can define what, what is an external body simply by taking the external support, and these are the rules, and we just pick their bodies, and then we call this set the external bodies, and these are actually the ones that we need. Because look here, right? We, we only are interested in the bodies of the rules here and there, and then we take the body formula, and then just rephrasing the condition with the external bodies simplifies things slightly. So this is then the definition that we get. And again, when we later on look at the algorithms, we will actually work on the atoms and the bodies, but not so much the loops. That's actually why I provide this alternative definition already here. Okay. Now, 
I will actually provide a, a, a blue board for this just to get a bit the idea to you by slowly working with a, with a stylus. But so you may pause here, look at the blue board or continue with the examples that I will provide next. Okay, so now I, I don't say stay tuned, I say bear with me. <laughs> okay, it's complex, right? But again, once you got the, the, the knit of it, it will be fun. Okay, so bear with me. Let's proceed in two batches. In the first batch of examples, we only look at how loop formulas are constructed from possible external supports. And in the second batch, we look at how these loop formulas can be used to eliminate unstable yet supported uh, models. Okay, so here's our first example. In this example, we have a single loop with a single element, namely the atom E. Accordingly, the external support for this atom consists of rules that have E in the head, but not among their positive body literals. And there's only one such candidate, namely this rule up here, right? Accordingly, our loop formula looks as follows. It says that if E is true, then the external support must have applied, that is the body of this rule must be true. That is B must hold and F must be false. Okay, and this is now our loop formula that we get for this very tiny loop. The second example promises to become slightly more interesting. Well, we still have a single loop, but at least we now have two atoms in this loop, namely C and D. And in addition, there are four rules that allow us to derive either C or D, hence four, uh, well, potential rules to, to provide external support. Okay, let's look at these guys. So these are the four rules with C or D in the head, right? And uh, now the question is, which of them are independent of the loop? That is, which of them do not have C or D among their positive body literals? And here we see this is only the case with the upper rules here, neither C nor D occurs. But on the other hand, the lower rules here C can be derived depending on D and D depending on C. So these actually, well, can only provide circular uh, support. So they cannot provide any external support. And we are left with these two upper rules as candidates for external support. So a bit more formally, just take, taking the, the abbreviations from the definition, the external support for our loop C and D in our program consists of these two rules here. Okay. Now that we have identified uh, these, these two e rules that can provide external support for our loop, what should our loop formula again express? Well, it should express that if one of the atoms in the loop, and this means at least one of the atoms has become true, then this must be supported by one of the external support. It's either this one or this one. Okay, so this is more or less the intuition. Now let's actually see how this looks in the loop formula. So here, here's the loop formula. And uh, it says that, well, if one of C or D have become true, then also one of the bodies of the external support rules uh, must be true, right? So if C or D are true, then either A and B are true or A is true by itself. I have not simplified this now, uh, just to reflect exactly the formulas that correspond <coughs> sorry, to the bodies up here. Okay, so now that we have seen two examples with a single loop, let's look at an example with several loops. Last but not least, here's our example with three loops and uh, accordingly we get three loop formulas. Let's just walk our way through these guys. So the first loop formula, right? So this is actually the loop between C and D. This is this guy here. And it's, this loop is induced by these two rules, right? Now, the loop formula says, well, if one of the atoms in the loop uh, become true, then either A or E must be true. This means either this rule here must apply or this rule must apply, right? These are the only external supports and just note that since our loop is C and D, neither C or D occur here in the positive body. So this rule and this rule, they are the external supports. Hence, we get this loop formula here. Now, the second loop consists of D and E. This is this guy here. And it is induced by these rules here. 
And here we get an external support by the two upper rules, um, which, which means then either B or C must be true or B and not A must be true. And this is exactly the condition that we have here um, as the consequent of the loop formula. And note that there is no other uh, support. There are only four rules that have D and E in the head. They are circular because they contain here there is E, here there is D. So these are the only two external supports. And last but not least, the loop with these three atoms, C, D, and E. This is this loop here in the positive atom dependency graph, and it is induced by these three lower rules. First of all, notice that uh, since the C is on the loop, this rule here cannot provide any external support. However, uh, this rule and this rule can, because they have A and B as positive body neutrals and A and B are not contained in this loop. Accordingly, this body here and this body are the external bodies and they are thus uh, here the, in, the, in the consequent of our loop. So if one of the atoms in the loop becomes true, then one of the external bodies must also be true. Okay, so I hope this gave you a flavor on how loop formulas are constructed. Now let's actually see them at work. While we've seen in the first batch of examples how loop formulas are constructed, let us now see how they help us to tell stable from unstable models. So you may remember our very first running example along with its single loop that results in a single loop formula. You may also remember that this program has two stable models, one where A and C is true and one where A and D is true. Now looking at the supported models, there are of course these two stable models plus one a supported yet unstable model. Now the question is now, does this loop formula here allow us to tell apart the stable from the unstable models here and serve like, well serve us as something like a litmus test for stable modelhood? Okay, let's just do it, right? What we do now is we check actually whether well, each model in turn is also a model of our loop formula. Now we start with the uh, first stable model A and C and we check whether this is a model of our loop formula and, and indeed since E is false in the model uh, the prerequisite of the implication is false hence the implication is true and this is also a model of our loop formula. Now let's take the second stable model A and D and again the same situation E is false in the model since e, is, since e is false, the whole implication is true. So the second stable model is also a model of our loop formula. Now let's look at the supported yet unstable model. In this case, actually, E is true. But once E is true, B must be true as well. But B is false. Hence, this here, this supported model, is not a model of the loop formula. And in a way, the loop formula tells us in this way what are the stable and what are the unstable models. At least it worked on this example. Let's look at the second example. So here's our second running example, also featuring a single loop yet with two atoms, C and D. What is also interesting here that this uh, loop has two external supports, namely the rule C if A and B and D if A, which is reflected by the disjunction uh, of the consequent of the loop formula. Anyway, now you may remember that uh, this program has two stable models, one with A, C and D and another one with B. And if you look at the supported models, we of course get the same, the same two guys here plus uh, a supported yet unstable model with B, C and D. This is actually the example I was referring to earlier when talking about harmful and harmless uh, applications of cyclic rules. So in the first context here, this is actually a stable model and actually all the atoms in the loop apply. And this is actually the case because given that we have A, we can derive D and once we have D, we can derive uh, C as well. Okay, on the other hand, if we look here at, at this supported yet unstable model, uh, these two rules apply. So D gives us C and also since B is true and, and C we get D, but the dependency between C and D is up in the air because neither of the two external supports applies. Anyway, 
Let us see actually how our loop formula allows us to detect this. Okay, again, as before, we just go through all the three models in turn and check whether the loop formula is entailed by these models. Okay, let's first take our first stable model, A, C, and D. So the loop formula is satisfied because, first of all, C is true, that's okay, but then also since A is true, A is a is true here, well, B is false, but that doesn't matter because A is true, hence the disjunction is true, and since C is true, the antecedent is true, and A is true, the consequent is true, the whole uh, implication is true. So, this means that our first stable model is also a model of the loop formula. Okay, let's check the second one. So in here, in this case, we are a little bit in the case that we have seen uh, on, on the previous example with where the idea is that since only B is true, well, neither C nor D are true, hence the antecedent of the loop formula is false and the whole loop formula is true. Hence, this stable or, or this supported model, since this model is both a stable and a supported model, is also a model for our loop formula. Check. Okay, now, last but not least, let's look at the, at the last supported but unstable model with B, C and D. Here in this case we have again C, even both C and D are true, so the antecedent of the loop formula is true, but now even though B is true here, A is false, hence this conjunction here is false, and since here, well, I just said A is, A is false, also the second dis, disjunct, disjoint is false, the whole disjunction is false, and since again the antecedent is true, the consequent is false, hence the implication is false, and this is not a model of our loop formula. So again, more or less, the loop formula served us as a litmus test for stable modelhood. It could actually tell apart which of the supported models are stable models and which are no stable models. And in fact, this is not a coincidence, as we see next. Unfortunately, I cannot provide a drum roll, but this is a central result in ASP, not only from a theoretical, but also from a practical perspective. But first of all, let's just see what it says. So, whenever we have a normal logic program, each model of its completion and loop formulas represents a stable model and vice versa. So, this finally gives us an axiomatization in classical logic of the stable models of a logic program. It gives us the conditions that really express what this stability of the models means uh, and more or less nails down um, what closed world reasoning is, right? Okay, so nonetheless you may ask yourself, what the heck? And well, the thing is, this is also, a, or this provides us as well with a blueprint for the implementation of effective ASP solvers. Why that? Oh well. In an ASP solver, you capture stable models ultimately uh, with a Boolean assignment. So a truth value of variables to true and false. So all of the variables must have a truth value. Now this is, and this also gives you the search space, right? So all possible combinations of truth values to the variables. But what are now the stable models? And this is now expressed, again, in a nice declarative way by the completion and the loop formulas. They give us the conditions such a Boolean assignment must satisfy to, in order to be a stable model. Okay, anyway, I just wanted to emphasize this because we will be looking at completion and loop formulas more or less for the rest of the course. Uh, and in particular, when it comes to implementation, they will play a central role. So, you better watch out for them and try to get back to the examples and get a good understanding of them. Okay, anyway, so let's actually wrap up this section and look at a few properties of these famous or infamous loop formulas. Loop formulas are in fact a quite powerful instrument. So we've seen one formulation of the Linzauer theorem. Let us just play with this a little bit, right? So, but now again, assume that we already have a supported model that is a model of the completion. And let's look at conditions, equivalent conditions, when this supported model is also stable. 
So here are four different uh, loop formula based characterizations. We have uh, actually been looking at the third one here where we really looked at the loops, right? But indeed we could go both ways. We could generalize this, we could look at all subsets of the supported model, we could even look at all subsets of the, of the alphabet, of the set of atoms in the program, or the other way by restricting the loop formulas to the ones contained in the, in the supported model. And all sets of formulas actually have an equivalent strength. That's quite interesting. And well, the, uh, finally, uh, what we have already looked at uh, in, in, the, in the first batch of examples that whenever there was a supported model that was not stable we've actually seen that in the set difference there is a loop and this is actually a general result so whenever we have a supported but unstable model there is one loop in the set difference between the supported model and the consequence of the program reduced uh, with this model and of course this uh, this supported model does not satisfy the loop formula of this loop. Okay, so this is just to give you some more properties and elaborate a bit on this. And then last but not least, we have the following property that is actually of quite some expressive nature. In fact, the expressiveness of a formalism is tightly connected to its computational complexity. We've already seen in the last part, when looking at a, a list of complexity results, that checking whether a propositional formula has a stable model needs two NP oracles, while checking whether a propositional formula has a classical model needs a single one. So in this case, actually, uh, using the closed world assumption needed one more NP oracle. Now, if you think of it, what we did now is we actually provided a translation from a closed world reasoning approach into an open world reasoning approach. So we mapped a program under stable model semantics into formulas under classical model semantics. So what happened to the complexity? And in fact, there is a result to this effect. In fact, um, there is a, a, another assumption to that. So unless a widely suspected uh, assumption in complexity theory collapses, every vocabulary translation of normal logic programs under stable model semantics into propositional formulas under classical semantics leads to an exponential blow up in space. Again, there is of course the vocabulary preserving issue here because if you use auxiliary atoms you may get around it. But anyway, if you do not do that, if you work over the same language you get an exponential uh, blow up. And in fact just to resume, so in our case, actually, our translation, of course, from programs into completion and loop formulas, first of all, preserves the vocabulary of the program. And the, the source of, of, of exponential growth actually lies in the number of loops. A program may have an exponential number of loops, and this translates into an exponential number of loop formulas, which are then, of course, of exponential size. So in a nutshell, actually, you will actually feel this when modeling, because you can simply model in actually in, in, in ASP under the under closed world reasoning in a more succinct way as you can do this in, in, in a classical logic. And after all, think of databases, think of my bus stop example from the beginning, right? It's much more space effective to list only the times when buses uh, actually depart than listing the ones where they depart and where they do not depart, right? That's of course the benefit of closed world reasoning. You save space, but well, you have to pay for that, and that's the price tag. Last but not least, I owe you some explanation on my remark earlier, why actually we do not necessarily have to define loops in terms of non-trivial strongly connected subgraphs. So here's again the definition of a loop, just like I gave it a couple of slides back, right? So a loop is a set of atoms that induces a strongly connected uh, subgraph of the positive atom dependency graph. And this non-trivial here relates to the fact that we only look at non-zero length path in the graph that we get. Actually, what we can do is we can drop this definition and also allow for a path of length zero. And what this will actually do, this will add all singleton uh, sets over the, over the atoms, right? So you take an atom and put it in a set and make a loop out of it, right? 
and you do this for all the atoms uh, and then these guys will also be loops so trivial loops so to speak and we can redefine um, loops in that way the interesting thing what happens then uh, we can actually simplify the Lin Zhao theorem by dropping the requirement that a, a, a model must also be a model by dropping the requirement that the model must also satisfy the completion formulas because this is now already subsumed by the loop formulas. How come? Well, after all, if we pick an atom and make a singleton loop out of this, right? Then the loop formula says, well, if this atom is true, then its external support must be true. And this is exactly uh, what we do when we add the necessary completion formula. So anyway, these loop formulas are a really powerful concept, as I was alluding to before. And this slide was mainly to give you some food for thought um, and perhaps to, to spark your interest in that. So anyway, that's it. That's the chap that was the, the section on loops. Let's now proceed and wrap up this part.